Okay. Let's see a little baby, but it's okay. Hello, anybody who has uh, signed on for our conversation this evening. You are in the right place. We're going to kick off in about 15 minutes, right at seven o'clock. So thank you so much. You can hang out. We're just streaming out today, so uh, you won't be able to uh, chat to us directly via Zoom. But if you're in Vimeo or on Facebook, you should be able to chat or comment either below or to the side of this lovely slide. And I take it by your message, Dan, that this means it's working.
Hi again, anybody who's joined us early on uh, this lovely stream here. Um, you are in the right place for our conversation this evening. Uh, new frameworks for performance. We'll be starting in about 10 minutes at seven o'clock. And if you need anything or you're interested in saying hello, there's a lovely chat either to the side or below the Vimeo video, um, which you can access uh, from the Playwright Center page or the HowlRound page. You can also email us at questions at pwcenter.org uh, if you have questions or um, just want to say hello. Hi again, anybody who has hopped on early for our conversation this evening. We are very excited to have you here. We'll be starting in about eight minutes, right at seven. If you have any questions or um, need anything, uh, we're not all on Zoom together this time. We're streaming out via Vimeo, but you can find a comment section either to the side or right below your um, Vimeo video.
Hello, everybody who's hopped on early to our live stream for tonight's conversation, Frameworks for Performance. We're so glad to have you here. We'll be starting in about four minutes, right at seven o'clock. If you have questions, I want to participate in the Q&A or uh, have any questions about how the, the live stream is working. If you're looking on Vimeo, whether that's linked from the Playwright Center page or the HowlRound page, you'll see a section either to the side or underneath uh, your video uh, box that has a chat or a comment section. All you have to do is put your name in uh, and then you'll be able to uh, comment there. Otherwise, you're welcome to contact us via email. Questions at pwcenter.org will be the place to send uh, the questions you have for our panelists this evening. Welcome everybody to our live stream artist conversation this evening. We'll be getting started uh, in about a minute. Uh, so whether you are tuning in on the Playwright Center page, the HowlRound page, or right on Vimeo, we're so glad to have you here. If you have uh, want to participate in the Q&A, which will happen a little bit later on in the conversation, or if you have questions about the live stream, if you're on Vimeo, you'll see a chat section probably to the side of your video box or right underneath where you just need to enter your name and then you can chat there. Otherwise, you can feel free to uh, contact us via email. Questions at pwcenter.org is the address to use. I'll be uh, on that all evening. Um, so feel free to send questions there as well. I'm gonna stop my lovely screen share right now and turn things over to Haley Finn whenever you're ready. Hey Haley. Hello, hi Julia. How's it going? Hey. Good, how are you doing? Good. Good evening, everyone. I'm Haley Finn. I use she, her pronouns and I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Playwright Center. And I'm really excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation, New Frameworks for Performance Now and Beyond. Before we get started, uh, I just want to acknowledge that Playwright Center sits on the traditional land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. And we offer our gratitude to this land for the privilege of gathering and sharing stories and conversations, and for the work of Native and Indigenous activists, past, present, and future, who steward this land and challenge us to be partners rather than owners of it. And for those of you outside of Minnesota, I hope someday you can come join us 
at Playwright Center and we can host you there. But for the moment, we're just so extremely grateful that we can gather in this way and connect with brilliant artists and new ideas. It has been quite a year and there has been a lot of pain and a lot of loss. But tonight I really want to center joy. And for me personally, what's given me a lot of joy this year is having inspiring conversations with artists, particularly artists who are expanding their artistic practice and thinking about form in new ways, challenging their very own notions of what theater can be. And certainly we're all familiar with Zoom performances at this point. And though I'm very grateful for those, um, that's not what we're gonna be talking about tonight. What we will be talking about are projects that are not conceived with the limitations of the pandemic in mind, but rather work that is thinking expansively about audience inclusion, new modes of collaboration, and visceral immersive experiences. Projects that investigate audience agency, interrogate notions of liveness, and consider the possibility that theater can be a shared global experience. I want to thank HowlRound for partnering with us on this conversation. The discussion will be about 90 minutes, um, and I'm going to leave the last part of it for questions from you. Um, I imagine, considering these amazing panelists, there will be many, many questions. Uh, if you do have a question at that time, you can send the questions to questions at pwcenter.org. Or if you're watching on Vimeo, either through HowlRound or through the Playwright Center website, you can put your questions in the comments section. All right, so for the very good, exciting part, um, I'm going to be introducing you to three incredible artists. Um, and what's what I find so inspiring about these particular artists is that they're challenging how they're thinking about performance on a daily basis. I want to welcome to the screen Candris Jones, Heather Raffo, and Tamala Woodard. Oh my gosh, we are it's so good to see you. I feel so blessed to be in conversation with you this evening. Thank you, thank you for being here. Um, there is, um, I, hello, hello. It's okay. Hi! I'm in the dark. <laughs> Maybe a little more Hi, light. Hi, good to see you, good to see you. Um, I just um, I just wanted to uh, say, I know you have their illustrious bio, so I'm not gonna go into full detail about their greatness. So I'm just gonna give you a little snapshot um, of their bio. So we'll start with Candris. Candris is a playwright, poet, an educator, and a recipient of the Many Voices and Jerome Fellowships at the Playwright Center. She's the author of Crack Baby and Flex, yes, cheer. <laughs> um, and she currently is on commission with Actors Theater of Louisville. Um, and she believes that in these times of peril, story and art matters more than ever. And I couldn't agree more. So thank you, Candace, for being here. Um, Heather Raffo is an award-winning playwright and actress whose work has been seen off-Broadway, off-West End, in regional theaters, and in film. She is the author of the play Nine Parts of Desire, which has received numerous accolades, a beautiful, beautiful piece, and her also stunning piece, Noura, which has premiered at the Shakespeare Theater before moving to Abu Dhabi, and then at uh, theaters across the country. Heather is also the recipient of the McKnight National Residency and Commission at the Playwright Center. Um, yes, Heather, cheering, yes. Um, and finally, the amazing Tamala Woodard, who is a co-artistic director at Working Theater. Tamala has directed at theaters nationally, internationally, including WP Theater, Baltimore Center Stage, American Conservatory Theater, Classical Theater of Harlem, the Cleveland Public Theater, among many, many others. Her work has also been recognized with an Off-Broadway Alliance Award, a Lucille Lortel nomination, and Tamala was also just appointed the chair of the Yale School of Drama Acting Department. Congratulations, Tamala. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I really just wanted to start by centering the work um, because I found their work to be so inspiring. And I'm wondering if each of you could just talk a little bit about the projects that you've been working on this year and what you've been thinking about. And um, what's what's really interesting is all these projects are in various stages of development. Some of them are actually been premiered, some of them that are, are going to premiere very soon, and some of them that are like in earlier stages. And I would love to start with Tamla, if you'd be willing to talk about your projects. You've been very busy this year. 
<laughs> American Dreams and Weightless, which I, I do want to say is a um, little plug for, is streaming right now on WPTheater.org. So please check that out. Please do. Um, it's been an amazing, um, it's been a year of like absolute tugging and pulling apart. And um, uh, I, I I, I think it takes this necessary, you know, I'll use the word violence, um, you know, the violence of change. Um, it takes that necessary violence of change um, for us to actually think about our ability to transform um, and actually um, um, feel the necessity of transformation and metamorphosis and evolution. We've all been feeling it, you know, for a long time. And then this was like, just the thing kicked us in the butt and was like, change or die, you know? And that's, that's you know, that's where we are. So um, I, I, I got, I started the, um, uh, uh, I, I got to produce something very early on called American Dreams with the amazing Layla Buck. Uh, it was a, a piece that was a, is a, envisioned as a uh, Im immersive and participatory piece in a theater <laughs> and premiered at Cleveland Public. Uh, um, uh, and, and it was really an amazing piece where an audience got to choose each night the winner of a game show called American Dreams. Um, there were three hopeful um, immigrants to the United States who were pitching themselves to an American audience and asking them to choose me. And in pitching themselves to an American audience, they were reflecting back the values and the ideals that we hold dear and do not practice <laughs> as Americans. And it was um, a slow, you know, I like to say the play happens inside of the audience. Um, that's actually where the play happens. And so part of part of thinking about how it could exist here um, was thinking that this is a place where the audience is inside of their own spaces, their own American comforts, their couches, their living rooms, their, you know, my refrigerator's right there full of whatever light beer, you know, they're, they're inside of the things that they hold dear, um, mainly their possessions and their status. And that they're looking at a person who is in another country, in our world, they were in another country, who's asking to be uh, able to be welcomed into the ability to gain those possessions and those status and to take part in this um, ideological experiment called the American dream. Um, uh, we, we didn't envision it for this space, but when we started thinking about how to make something site specific for the space, it was like, hands down, we're like, we already have something. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's already a TV show. We were just doing it in a theater and now it's a TV show, <laughs> a live TV show. So our, our big challenge was how to create a, a live television show experience for an audience. Um, and we got an amazing team, Kate Freer um, and Vidco to imagine, basically they were the scenic designers of the space to imagine how to create an immersive participatory television studio that an audience could live vote, see those votes tallied live and pick a different um, winner every night. Um, and it was, it was really, um, it was one of those things where we went past innovation and we really, really put our toe into like pure invention because there were no systems really available um, for us. And these guys Frankenstein, some beautiful new monster that was American Dreams. That's so beautiful to hear you talk about that. I think what's also so exciting is that the form itself is so built into the content, you know, that, that they're really working synergistically. Yeah, I teach and one of the, and I was teaching a class called the, well, I was teaching a, a class that was an intro, was basically inviting all of our students to take hold of the, of the fact that we were not going to be in class together, <laughs> that this was going to be the form of our storytelling. And one of the things, you know, the core tenets was make sure the content and the form need each other. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. You know, and that that is like, that has to be the first, like, content and form have to be um, like a really ideal marriage mm -hmm. and that your job as an author is to author both of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Especially as we're thinking about new forms, what does that mean that challenges us to think in, in new ways about that marriage? So I, I love that, I love that. 
And what about I talk? Oh, I feel like I've talked so long. I can come, but Waitlist is is a beautiful concert <laughs> film um, that we made. It was supposed. It is um. It is a um. It is a pl- a. a it's based on Ovid's Metamorphosis, the story of Procne and Philomela, two sisters who are devoted to each other. One has a bad marriage and has to be rescued. <laughs> In the rescue, the god actually observes from a distance, but be- gets closer and closer and, ob- and asks the question, why do humans do this? Why do humans love so hard when it costs you so much and you know you will lose people? And in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of the COVID crisis, where we all sustained such loss Mm -hmm. um and um this was such a it was a question that um we all came around is why do we love when we know that we will lose and we watch the god who's really you know a human um learn the value of loving loving hard and loving deep um and it's all told through music and we created a concert film of it that um my guiding principle was uh uh, point of attention. Mm-hmm. And as a, as a new filmmaker, I needed somebody to help me understand why this could be feel like live theater. And I had great advice from um, um, uh, my cinematographer, Peggy, who's like, it only matters what you want us to see mm-hmm. and yeah. how you want us to see it. Right. So that's what the camera should do. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> Right, t- taking that knowledge and figuring out how that um, theatrical experience can exist. In that yeah. Performance. yeah, yeah. So it was choreography. We called the camera choreo because we wanted the audience to feel like they were flying in, moving through the space, and you know, really had a point of view um, um, that was in concert with the film, with with the music, with the way that the music moved through space. Chagall was our was our our fairy inspiration. Oh, I love that. I love yeah, that. yeah. Um, well, let's go on to Candrus because I want to talk a bit about your project. You're working on a, a virtual reality play, and um, I know it's your first time um, in this medium. And I'm hoping that you could tell us a little bit about your project and how it was developing work in this new medium for you. Um, first of all, um, Tamala, I hate that I didn't see American Dreams. I don't think I found out about it until after <laughs> it was over. And I was like, well, that sucks. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I really wanted to see it because it, you know, it it just sounded like, okay, this, these people really got to have a handle on what exactly is needed at this time. And I, yeah, I just hate that I missed it, but I'm so glad that you guys did it. Um, so, um, the project that I'm working on, um, is, um, started with a commission with Actors Theater Louisville and, um, they're collaborating with a, um, well, it's, it's, it's a company led by Lauren Ruffin, um, black woman who has <laughs> all these aspirations for what VR can be, um, for, you know, developing new audiences. And so, um, Actors Theater of Louisville, of course, approached me and stated they wanted to create something um, under the moniker of Black Girl Fix It. <laughs> And so I, you know, started dreaming up all these ideas and I came up with this narrative that's currently entitled Beyond the Crossroads. And it is being created with, it is being created within the virtual reality space. (laughs) One would need an Oculus, well, well, we are using Oculus headsets, are creating in the world of Oculus headsets. My headset is somewhere over there, if, you know. But um, in short, the content is a blues narrative. And so I was thinking of brainstorming ways that I could connect my southernness, <laughs> my love for writing about the South and women of the South and thinking about how the, the narratives are the type, the type of narrative that I quite haven't created, but am absolutely drawn to. And for me, it was the blues narrative and how 
black women um, fit in the world of blues lore. And so I started thinking about, you know, of course, the plays of August Wilson, but also my experiences in gr uh, growing up in the rural South and um, going to blues festivals, listening to blues all, all my life. Um, so many people think that the blues is kind of hieroglyphic. Oh, it's this thing that existed back then and no one makes music in the blues <laughs> tradition anymore or it's not something that young people are attracted to. But my nieces and nephews listen to the blues and there are young blues artists their age that they absolutely adore and they enjoy their songs and they want their autographs and all that. So anyway, um, I wanted to create a narrative about a young woman who was trying to find her, her, her own voice within um, the entire blues realm. So at first, the project has gone through quite a few changes. At first, I wrote an entire play that was a choose your own journey play. <laughs> And that had, it was 70 something pages long, had three endings, and I think it was pretty dope. <laughs> um, however, what we found or what, you know, what we decided was because we wanted, wanted it to fit in the world of um, virtual reality is that those narratives are not very long um, because if you are in a headset, you can only spend so much time there. So we actually cut it down to like 22 pages. <laughs> and it's still an immersive project. It's still about a young woman named Caprice um, who is trying to find her voice. And the audience helps to guide her. Um, the audience is actually given a name. They're part of the cast. They're called the Faithful Audience. <laughs> and um, they work with this ancient blue spirit, Vera, to help Caprice along this journey. And um, this week, um, we, we're, we just bought performers on board maybe two weeks ago. So everyone is still getting used to their technology. But one thing that I really, really like is how when I first started playing in the world of the Oculus, I got really excited. At first I was like, what is this? And then I experienced it and got really excited. And now it's, it's really fun <laughs> to watch others go through that same process and go from how are we going to do this to we really want to do this and this is dope and seeing themselves as avatars and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's been cool. It sounds you know, like an, an amazing, amazing project. And again, this idea of like how form is working, I'm just curious to know for you, Candace, about what being in that VR uh, world has done to like your writing, like has that shifted how you write? Um, as far as themes and content, um, just like Tamla was just saying, you always want to explore. And in my playwriting, I always explore how um, content and form meet like my play flex is shaped like a um, four quarter basketball game a play that I just wrote uh, Medusa Thread which is also inspired by obvious metamorphosis um, it follows the trajectory of getting a hairstyle so like consultation shampoo <laughs> deep condition deep condition um in style and you know the reveal or whatever so i've always really thought about how form meets content one thing about um working in this particular realm or this particular um medium is that the world is so expansive so i get a chance to explore depth and how visually how how deep a world can be and I get to play with that. Um, I get to play with not only depth visually, but with sound. Of course, being a blues play, we, we're using music. So, you know, I, I and we're working with composers. And I'm getting to, you know, communicate with them, you know, re regarding, okay, what sounds do we want close? What sounds do we want distance? How, how does a transition sound in this world? And the idea of all the, all the sounds surrounding the individuals who are in this world. So um, one, you know, and, and how that does affect the, in the overall content and how that content 
you know, gives the audience a feel of being, you know, immersed within the world. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Thank you, Candace. Heather, I'm gonna turn things over to you and your piece tomorrow will be Sunday, which you're developing and have been working on at the Playwright Center. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about your project. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, at, the, at its, in its nutshell, it's about migration and the global economy. Um, but it's, it, but it's, it's, it's so broad that for the longest time, it felt like it was hard to even talk about or hard to even find a narrative to say, oh, it's about this. But essentially I'll say like how it came to be was that I had a lot of family in Iraq um, at the start of the first Iraq war. And now they're kind of scattered all over the world. So the refugee crisis, as we like to call it, was super personal. But when I follow their trajectories, it is about their personal stakes and their thresholds for leaving. But everything, when I would kind of boil down what's underneath this, what's underneath this, it became an economic factor. Mm -hmm. And I kept looking at the way, let's say we in America talked about migration and refugee issues, and it was always like victim or enemy. And I kept, kept trying to like uncover, uncover, uncover. And I kept coming down to economic factors. And the more I looked at that, the more I was involved in my personal life as we all are, right? <laughs> and I was like, I think, I think I'm starting to see the world in every way through the lens of values and what, it, what is value and who do we value and why do we value them this way? And how do those values translate to economic factors? But what, what are those currencies and what are they really about? And what if I follow these tributaries and currents and currencies and rivers, where will I get in the end? So I just started writing scenes that took place all over the map. And I tried to really allow myself to have process instead of product. I tried to be super vulnerable and brave and go, I don't know. I'm just gonna write some, I'm just gonna write some things that are like in front of my face and until I write them, I won't know what they even are. Um, and what, what I've come to, which is actually where I started in the project, which was me saying, I want a new platform for my way of making theater. I also want a new platform for the theater. And those two things, I couldn't name and I didn't even know how to get at other than to say, oh, I want a new platform, right? I had no idea what I meant by that. I just knew that I was in pursuit of it. So I figured process would eventually show me. So by new platform, what I meant was doing a play on stage was, could be beautiful, could be amazing, but had so much about it that was deeply unsatisfying. The route to getting it onto that stage could be full of gatekeepers and could be totally unsatisfying for, for that reason. But I'm talking even once, right? Even once one cracks through and goes, oh, it's on the stage. I'm like, how, how is it that this thing that I built to be in conversation with all these communities I built it in is now not in conversation with any of those communities? Mm. And then my head would explode and I go, well, how, how did this happen? right? Or how did I propose, hey, I built this in community over here and over here and have people go, not a value, not a value, don't want that scary. Hmm. And I go, how could you know what? <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's the goal. That's the most exciting thing. And so I was kept trying to put those things together. Also, I, I did have the good fortune of traveling a lot, but then I'd be like, I, I was just in a university classroom in rural Pennsylvania. And two days later, I'm in a classroom in Iraq and both sets of students are kind of asking me the same thing about each other. How are they not shared audience? They're shared audience for me. They're both asking me the questions. They're both talking about my play or process or theater, blah, blah, blah. but why are they not in the same space? So this platform that I was thinking about that I couldn't name was like, I'm Middle Eastern and I'm Midwestern. I'm New Yorkian and I'm Midwestern. 
I do rural, I do main stage. I've worked in the military and I've worked with Arabs. <laughs> like, like how, why is it everything about my life feels incrementable? I don't belong anywhere. The theater is supposed to be my home. Not sure I belong here. Like how, how do I, how do I create a platform to do this thing, right? But then I realized the platform might be in the making of it itself. And then of course, in the midst of my chaos and overwhelm of all of that, um, COVID happened and then we were forced onto new platforms. And then I went, oh, well maybe, <laughs> maybe this is the answer or maybe this is on its way to being the answer. And no, the answer isn't a Zoom play, but the answer, at this moment is how to work globally, how to write something about the way we in every part of us everywhere are affecting migration globally and how to show that butterfly process in these economic transactions that increasingly get more human so there is no protagonist, let's say, there is this multiplicity of narrative, but now that I'm like digging into this platform, I'm also really wondering it quite excitingly about the multiplicity of, of design, the multiplicity of who makes it, right? So that it's not like I and one other person, in some place in America say, let's make this global play, right? And then ask people to do something. Like maybe this is this deconstructed process where it's it really is just thrown out and made in different parts of the world, but made um, within community somehow that is, um, Maybe it's got multiple directors. Maybe it's got multiple. I don't know what I'm asking for. I see. You see, I don't have the. I don't have the language for it. I'm just saying. I think there's a way to actually make it that heightens what I'm trying to say as I'm trying to find this thing through the writing. But at the moment, it's following currencies. So you can start with, let's say, currency of labor's currency of borders currency of education, currency of oil, but I mean, where we're going, where I've always gone in my work is what's the currency of loss, right? How do we get to a point of loss and then realize, oh, we're really all together in this. Often, often in my world, in my Iraqi world, it's like, oh, it takes all this loss to go, aha, <laughs> we're, we're in it together. We're really connected we've lost so much, right? So I think that as much as I wouldn't wish loss on anyone, I do think we're in a global moment of being able to connect in our hearts, possibly, in a way we never have before. And so it, it will hopefully follow heart in the midst of all this economic, um, questioning. And the final thing that it is, is it's really unpacking the currency of empathy in the American theater, which is something that I've always been aware of, using, and upset by. That I love empathy. Believe me, I love empathy. I teach my kids empathy. I believe in empathy. But empathy in the American theater has just constantly otherized a lot of people, um, it is completely otherized the Arab American voice. It is completely otherized Middle Easterners to just be like, we can't empathize. Like all they want to, all the audience seems to want to do is come in and empathize and then walk away and go, oh, see, we cried. We had a good cry now we're, right? And I think that this kind of provocation of saying, what do you do with your empathy in the theater? It's not a like on faith, like this has to go somewhere. So I'm kind of, maybe I'm, maybe I'm full swinging too far the other way of like, I don't know if I want any empathy. I might just want some facts, right? Like real facts that don't involve empathy to just make us see value structures and go, do we value humans? Whether we empathize with them or not, do we value them? Now what? So it's, it's it, right now it's living right there. Um, 
a lot of it's written, too much of it's written, and there's probably like 10 more hours to be written. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. Um, well, Heather, there's a lot in what you said that needs to be unpacked. I don't know if we're even going to have time to delve into all of this tonight, but there's been many hours of conversation. I, I feel very fortunate that I've gotten to to uh, be part of some of the process and see you, you through some of it and some of the questions that you've been asking. Um, and what's sort of interesting is that this moment is how, um, in terms of platform, maybe you're still finding that perfect marriage that Tamala, who's kind of been on the other side of it, is like, we well, yeah, I found the perfect marriage maybe it seems like you're still kind of searching and chasing that perfect marriage of form. Um, although in some of our conversations, you've said that it might exist online in some form of an online platform with maybe live components, et cetera. So in a sort of hybridic model, um, which is fascinating. And I know I'm, I'm so, I've gotten a chance to spend some time with this project and I'm quite in, enamored with it as Heather knows. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll, we're going to talk about all this, but one of the things that I think is so interesting is in many of the projects that you guys have talked about, there's been elements of um, how the audience participates. Like that seems to be a big question. Like how does the audience participate? Do they have agency in some way in the narrative? Um, certainly in American Dreams, it seems like they were having some kind of agency, but and also, what does that mean? What does that, or maybe that was a false agency? I don't know. You know, what does that mean? Do we feel that um, that's something that you're interested in, or you're chasing, or you feel has value? And to what end? Just I'm putting it out there as a question. Yeah, for me, all, you know, all my students know this because I say the same thing. It's written right here, which is all theater is participatory. All of it is. It's just the level of participation that is required or that is needed for the piece to actually like live. And in this particular, in American Dreams, the level of participation that was needed for the thing itself to lodge itself in you was for an audience to choose and choose and choose and choose and choose. And, choose. and then at some point go like, oh shit, why am I choosing? What is it about this you? that I find is more valuable, even though I empathize with the other person. Mm -hmm. You know, I love, Heather, that you're thinking about value and empathy, because usually we try, usually the theaters like empathy makes people see value. And you're going like, let's look at value first. Um, and I'm just like that, you know, you're thinking about systems where someone has to you know, put forward something. I think of the arcade and I think of peep shows where you have to put money in to mm. see the next thing or to move yourself forward. Like you have to invest in the experience moment by moment by moment. And I'm thinking like, I love this idea that we're asking an audience because it's what we need to do. We can't all feel each other because mm. some of us just can't. Mm -hmm. But most people practice minute by minute assigning value to something. Mm -hmm. Am I going to say hello to that person on the street? Am I going to walk by? <laughs> mm. Yeah. I can't hear Heather. She's talking. I know Heather, it seems oh, like no. you, also, you, know, you guys can feel free to unmute yourselves. We don't have to, you know. Oh, it's like talking at you, Tamala. <laughs> <laughs> You're brilliant. You're always brilliant. Um, um, I'll say, yeah, agency that I'm considering in my piece is, um, is, is twofold. A, the hypothesis that we've all been on the move since the beginning of time, like migration is normal, right? And that we're all going to be on the move because of climate change. Like we're all going to be on the move because of climate change. So, so those hypotheses of how, who thinks they're not moving yet? <laughs> <laughs> who thinks they're safe, right? Where are they centered and where do I like push and say, look, we're all on the move. And then back to the agency of um, how does everything we do really affect the movement of people everywhere, right? So that everything we buy, everything we touch really got touched by thousands of people. And how, mm -hmm. how, how do I help the audience see that that chain that living supply chain that living human chain um and make them feel somehow in this play that almost everything they do which room they walk through or what they watch or if they've clicked if it's online like how does every choice they make 
immediately impact. I don't know how to do it. It's just the questions of that. That's where the agency would lie. Mm -hmm. The questions are always at the heart of it, though, I think. Um, what about for you, um, Kendris, and your piece? Oh, the agency in my piece is very um, connected to what Tamla said at first. It's like when you go into a video game or an arcade, or I thought about um, if you've ever played Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> and if the player doesn't move, um, or if you don't, if you don't make the thing move, then nothing happens. It just, you know, it just sits there and the time runs out or whatever. But, you know, just thinking about if I'm in the position, like I said, the cast, the cast for me or the faithful audience that I've labeled in the piece is part of the cast for me. And therefore they have to be present. <laughs> they have to be active. In order, in order for the story to move forward. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a point in which they have to make a call or judgment based on want, need, um, knowledge of everything that has happened in the play. So this is, this is where, you know, actively the agency just really comes in. They, mm -hmm. they actively have to, you know, play a tambourine or, you know, do something in order to make the narrative move forward. So it's, it's very simple. Um, but at the same time, I do think that if I am, you know, an audience member immersed in this narrative, I am thinking about like how effort, because certain efforts have to be made. It's, you know, physically how effort plays into making creating a desired outcome so mm -hmm. yeah um one thing that we talked about earlier for me as far as agency you know just outside of the audience agency and you know i'm still thinking about that too is how the pandemic um well prior to the pandemic <laughs> me and the other fellows from the playwright center last year were had conversations about how can we as artists and Heather, you touched on this beautifully <laughs> a moment ago, how can we as artists, um, how, how can we expand the universe in which our stories are told? So we're playwrights and we fell in love with theater. That is my sacred space. And we write hopefully to get a thing onto the main stage. Um, I think of, uh, again, I think about August Wilson <laughs> and the ground on which I stand and in which she said, you know, um, we, we don't, we don't need colorblind casting. We need some theaters. And that was 30 years ago. And we still need some, we still need some theaters. So, <laughs> you know, the, the thing about it is, I think with the, what the pandemic has forced us to do is think about where do our theaters exist? Um, and the fact that, you know, um, there are a lot of blurs out there <laughs> who already have VR headsets, who are already, you know, in these realms that we're creating, but they don't see themselves. There aren't there, there aren't that many avatars that, re that are representative of people other than white people, to, to be honest. And there aren't that many narratives that are representative um, of narratives that fit outside the the white mainstream narrative. It's you know, it's it everything you know. I think everything is kind of like reflective of you know the larger world that it fits in. So um, you know, I just feel like you know, creating content in this particular area, um, being the being given the chance to do that has allowed me as a playwright some agency in, you know, in rediscovering how or discovering new ways or new uh, or a new platform. The the teams that I'm working with, we're already wondering what we can do next. So <laughs> that's so great. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm very excited about that. So yeah, it's you know you you we're, we're talking about audience agency and that is very important to me. Um, when I first, um, was introduced to the Oculus headset last year, well, I already knew, I knew, I already knew about VR or whatever, 
but the idea of theater in that world, I really did frown on it. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, so you're taking a thing that's already inaccessible and making it even more inaccessible. But one refreshing thing or one surprising thing that I learned, and I should know this because I'm, you know, part of the part of Facebook extraordinary journey of the black nerds group (laughs) um is that there is already an audience there that's craving content that's craving narrative that's craving stories that reflect our history our experiences and yeah that's it that's beautiful um candace thank you for sharing that and i think you bring up two really important points one is just about uh agency as it exists to the forum and how the audience is so integral to um, the piece moving forward, but then also agency, as you're saying, as an artist, right? And I think what's so exciting about all of your work is that you're um, you're not wait you're you're not sitting back and, and waiting for someone else to tell you what theater is or trying to put it on a stage or knock on a door to get your piece done. In a way, you're really creating your own way of thinking about performance and putting that forward. And so I'm very excited, not just about this work, but the work that you're going to be moving forward to come. Um, I also want to talk just a little bit about collaboration through this process, because it's such a different kind. So many of these are so different in terms of their processes than traditional process. I'm curious to know what the collaborative process has been like and what you might learn from it. Oh man, <laughs> I have had the best collaborate. I, I really have. I mean, we're um, the, n- not what, yeah, I, 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 the, you know, content, form, but also who's in the room mm-hmm. really matters. And um, every single, you know, both uh, Weightless and American Dreams came out of the skills and the, and the, um, incredible imagination of every single human on that team. Their ability to look past what has been and into a future and bring forward a future in in our present moment. And, you know, I'm going to let you guys like say all your things, but I'm going to say these people out loud. Lila Blue, Coffee Brown, Dan Harris, Kate, Gilbane, Dan Moses, Joshua Pollock, Catherine Fear, Yi Nam, Peggy, Perlata, David, Reynosa, Gregory Kuhn, Hilton Day. I'm going to say those folks out loud because they were authors. Catherine Fear and Vidco again, and, and Ryan Patterson and Carrie McCarthy and Sam Kuznets and Stacey DeRossier and Colleen Mc. Mc, Mc Cautery and Carolina Arboleda and the Watsons and Lori Henning and Mike Dio and Nitsun and Ryan and Amanda and Cherie Bite who took the photos. All those people invented something in order for either of those projects to happen. And I'm telling you, it would be different without one of them not there. Mm-hmm. That's great. I always think it's a very like spiritual thing to add more artists into the room. So thank you, Tamala, for, for offering them. Um, and we should all follow all of their work as well. It kind of is the, goes back to Heather and the tributaries of, of all the different, um, and there's that image stuck with me. Um, what about either for you, Candrus, or you, Heather, just what the collaborative process has been like? And Heather, you've talked about kind of envisioning a, a, a collaborative process that is potentially quite expansive. Oh, I mean, I'll just say that the Playwright Center has just been hugely integral. You've been hugely integral, Haley in that um, when I talk about this piece, it's not easy. It's not easy for people to grasp it. I have found that there's a, even in 2020, even in 2021, when things are changing so much, um, there's this show me the product. Mm -hmm. We'll innovate in how we produce it, but show me the product. And I'm trying to show process. It's not that I don't have, pro- like I have, I have bones of product. I have some product, but it's like, it's it all, every T isn't crossed yet on my product, right? And it's, I will say that um, there, there wasn't another home for me and you made home for me. Like you, you also picked me up when I was flat 
going, I, I think I, I don't think this will ever work. I'm not sure what to ever do anymore. Like, you know what I mean? So I think that, that the, what I'll say is that the, to work in a place that is allowing process to happen and allowing us to ask the questions of process in the 2020, 2021 arena is massive. Because you would think, I mean, I would think, I would think that every, every theater was on pause so everybody would be asking the question, <laughs> right? But, but it's not that the Playwright Center was the place I could ask that and, and keep picking up the pieces and having you help me relook at this. So I would say that, yes, our collaborators are, are integral to every phase but but our homes mm -hmm. having a home changes everything i mean i i guess i speak i'm i'm constantly that's the nature of my life as a as a half per, halfsy person anyway i'm always like i don't belong anywhere but like to to have the playwright center be that grounding base and have me say i think i'm exploring this this week and probably like you're pulling your hair out haley because i'm like i'm exploring this this week next week i'm go well i think i'm exploring this and you're like but last week you said and we were gonna <laughs> like and i know how frustrating that is but you just keep ground you just kept grounding the conversation and helping me go oh because i want to explore both at the same time and i didn't know how to name that right it's been a joy, I have to say, Heather. It's been an absolute joy, and I and I love process. Anyone who knows me just knows that I love process and conversation and interrogating ideas, and um, especially with brilliant thinkers like you. So it's been a real joy. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Kendra's because I know you you've talked a little bit to me about some of your collaborators, and it sounds also just really exciting because there are people working in really different ways than maybe some people in the theater. Uh, the collaborators in this process, I I wish I had done a list like Tamla, I mean, <laughs> because every, th there's so much authorship in this process. Um, from Actors Theater Louisville to um, National Black Theater gave me time and space to work, to work on this project. Um, of course, Crux Creative as as well as um we we have the the music composers rhythm science sound who are based in louisville um we have you know, just an expansive amount of you know personalities and people working on this project who animate of course the animators <laughs> who are you know bringing who are creating the worlds and the avatars <laughs> you know but seeing how this one idea, you know, has sparked, you know, creativity in so many people from, you know, the, from the authors to the administrators who are part of, you know, who are part of everything. And it's, it's just been like a really amazing process. And, you know, as, as, as Heather was saying, you know, as play playwrights, we're used to collaboration. You know, we know when we, or we hope that when we start a play, eventually we're going to have a strong group of collaborators. And when those collaborators come in, it's always um, just a thank. I'm I'm just always so thankful for every collaborator who steps in. And when you see ideas just springing <laughs> out of everyone's head and them forming new content on top of the content and you're like oh i imagine this world but shit, like it is coming to life and just yeah it's it's just an amazing process that could not be done without people putting their hearts and minds and creative energy into the entire process i i I'm very aware this is the largest team that I've ever worked with. It's crazy. Um, but, you know, everyone is an expert <laughs> in their own, you know, in, in, in their own thing. And also maybe, you know, like taking up slack, you know, where other people are, you know, just needing a little bit of help. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's just very exciting to have this many people working on this one project and seeing what can come out of it. And my, Julia told me I'm a little low. Am I still a little low? Oh, you mean volume wise? I can hear you. I mean, you right, cause that's why I'm leaning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good to, it's good to lean in. Cause I hear you right. do hear you a little bit better when you lean in. So thank uh -huh. you for that. Um, thank, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one last question and then we're going to turn it over to you all the audience. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the notion of liveness because, um, you know, you're creating pieces, some of which um, are taking place in theater, some of which are taking place online, some of which are in a VR world, some are in new platforms altogether. I'm curious about your thoughts about liveness, how you chase that idea in your work, even if it's not in a quote, quote theater space. Anyone want to jump in with that? Well, I'll, I'll just talk about <laughs> the experiencing liveness in this particular platform. Great. Um, there, there was, there was a, a, a moment where I went into a particular experience, um, called traveling while black and the, the feeling that I had, um, being in the Oculus headset and but also feeling as though because it was a pre-recorded experience um about traveling as an african-american person in the united states and um it, some of it was set in a cafe and it's at one point you're standing in this animated world and then suddenly you're switched to a 3d capture with actual people and you feel like the people are beside you and at that time in january in minneapolis during the pandemic in which i hadn't sat beside too much of anyone that absolute feeling of line of liveness it was like catharsis it was it was really unbelievable um I do think that there are certain elements that we use all the time in entertainment, in theater, to give individuals, to create distance or give indiv individuals, you know, the, the feeling that you are there. I think that's like what the heart of, or, you know, the, the fascination with empathy is, mm -hmm. you know making people feel that they are there. And many times, you know, you, we rely on the performers to do it. If a, if a performer, you know, um, does emotes or whatever well enough, then the audience might be able to feel like they are in their shoes, no matter how far away they are from the, from the stage or whatever. But I do think that um, whether it's, you know, in an Oculus headset or, you know, through some other platform. I think at this, at this moment, you know, in 2020, 2021, where we literally crave the, um, just being in the same space with other people. I think our, our attention is, you know, turning to how can we, <laughs> you know, give somebody else joy like literally give somebody else joy, even if that person is an actor on stage who, who usually gives us, you know, joy. Um, how, how can we give, you know, that, you know, other thing, that other person, how, how can we translate, you know, what we have in our own minds, bodies, and spirits to another person and how to do that, you know, without actually touching, you know, um, so I, I, you know, I feel like that's going to be a constant exploration after this. I don't think that exploration is going to end because I don't think the virus is going to end too quickly, <laughs> but, but also I don't think that necessity, like we are, that's like, that's what's been in or being invented out of these necessities, how to actually contact other people. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's like a visceral experience. Yeah. 
Um, Heather, since I can't. You know, good, riding on that, I, I I agree with you entirely, Candris. And I and I when I think about liveness too, I'm thinking about what does it mean to be vulnerable with each other, and what does it mean to be alive with each other. And I think about, I mean, because just yes, I've acted on stages and felt very alive and vulnerable to audiences, but sometimes it's only to the extent that the audience wants to also be vulnerable back to you, which can be powerful and amazing and often be very true. But then there's, just to compare for a second, there's this, there's a theater going audience that's so used to going to theater sometimes that they're not that vulnerable anymore. Mm -hmm. They're not really opening and sharing. And then I have this experience over 2020 where I'm caregiving for my mom. I'm in Michigan for eight months. I mean, maybe she's seen five plays in her life, right? And I'm zooming all these things for my work and my life and my industry and my stuff. And she's just walking past, go, well, well, now what's that, right? And it's like, well, it, 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 it. she's just getting herself, she doesn't even know she's on screen. You know, she, I'm making fun, but the point is, off times, she just find herself sitting, being completely vulnerable to this situation. And given, given how many Middle Eastern women I've worked with across the world that are like, we're reading, we're reading your plays behind closed doors in secrets with our mothers because it's too, right? We can't do this in public. Mm -hmm. How many people, how many people are being genuinely vulnerable to what they're seeing on screen with grandmas and family members who wouldn't be going to the theater watching too? And to me, there's something so alive about that. Yeah, I mean, it goes beyond this notion of what we're talking about, about increased audience, right? Mm -hmm. Communities across the globe, um, ticket prices are cheaper, therefore it's more equitable. Like I'm talking like beyond all that, it's the accidental person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, I'm sorry. I, I, is, I don't yeah, yeah, no, I get you. Yeah. That's like yet another layer, mm -hmm. right, yeah. right? Or my friend who was in, a colleague who was doing a reading of a play, she was in a university production anyway. She's like, she invited her family from Nigeria who had never, ever, ever seen a play before. So suddenly they're watching her university production, five year reunion of a play I wrote, right? During 2020, like the vulnerability and aliveness of that is just kind of why I'm alive. <laughs> like that, that's why theater that's like, no, it's not a, and I know we got on this conversation earlier, sorry, I'll circle around to, to wait lists because I, I had the experience, Tamala, of like, this is live. I know it's filmed, of course it's filmed, but it's live. Why is this, why is this a live theater event for me more than it's a film for me? And I don't know how to name it. I have no vocabulary for that, except that they felt vulnerable to me and I vulnerable to them in a way that it was like, oh, we're meeting and you're showing me the story, but I'm not, maybe I feel more manipulated in film. Like you're being, I don't, I don't know. It was just, it was so, you put me with them and there I was, I was watching live theater. I think that's a great transition. I'm curious to know, Tamala, for you, as you were creating that piece, you know, were you chasing the idea of liveness and like, what, what did that mean for you? And, and how are you thinking about making it not a film, but more theatrical? I was not chasing the idea of liveness, but, but what Heather said earlier, aliveness. Aliveness. And aliveness, which was about, and, and so we decided to do something that was super, super hard, which was one take. And so we did four days of single takes and it was, you know, and so the, our, our cameras were moving, it's me on the headset and I'm like, you know, uh, camera one, move, move, you know, go closer, you know, close up here and camera two, get ready for this shot. And, you know, so we were doing it live. So it was live caught for us. We had like, we were moving in concert with those storytellers on that stage and trying to feel them and feel the music and feel the day and feel where the wind was that was blowing the ribbon, you know, wherever. <laughs> 
<laughs> that ribbon That's was, like, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> choreographing. Yeah. You talked about the choreography of things. It sounds like you were right. choreographing the filmmakers, you know, the, the cinematographers even in their own movement. Yeah, it was That's like, um, it was like dance improv. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like we knew what the concept was. <laughs> Okay. And we sort of knew the chapters of it, but it would it would change as we as we went along. And so I think Heather, thank you so much. But I think it's like it was because all of us were like we knew we couldn't stop. There was no let's do another take. It was like the sun's going down. It's like go, oh, you know. Um, hopefully, copy like you know. Oh, there she goes. She's 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 walking towards the camera. Awesome. And so there was a real sense of um, you know good panic, you know you know good good to borrow from uh, a, a source I shouldn't borrow from in this way, but good trouble. We were putting ourselves in harm's way for a good re like we were like we were in a place where um, uh, we were putting on the line the idea in order to be responsive to the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that is ultimately liveness. Mm -hmm. When an actor gets on stage, they've rehearsed and that's the idea. Mm -hmm. And when they come on stage, that's the moment. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's really what I love so much about theater. It's different. It's um, I tell you know that my my um, cast. I say, hey, those people here that were here yesterday, they're not here today. They don't know anything about yesterday, so you can't come and be like, I'm doing yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, they'll be like, I don't know what you're doing. That was yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> that's that. You're in a rehearsal room and you're like, yeah, that you see someone doing yesterday and you're like, oh, that's so, that's so not where we are right now. So. Yeah, that's not it. And I love that. I love Kendra's that, that I get to, you know, I'm the only you, like when I put on a, you know, and I, I have had a small VR experience. <laughs> 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 and just been like thrilled that there is a universe made for me mm -hmm. which is essentially what the theater is like we are constantly trying to tell the audience we made it for you it's for you yeah. tonight and yeah. that is the ultimate version of that thing mm -hmm. it's for me right now yeah yeah that's beautiful um well now we're going to move on to questions so it's for you all out there tonight um, to hear from you. And I have a couple of questions that are coming in. So I'm going to um, send them to the, the group. I'm going to start with Danny has a question. How do you get your audience to participate with their imaginations? Do you allow for ambiguity in performance to invite them to fill in? No. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you don't allow, no, no, no. Yeah, audiences yeah. get lost. Audiences get lost. You mm -hmm. have to be really clear about what you intend for them to do and really clear about the, I, I feel in participatory things, it's like one of the things that we had to do with American Dreams was continually to hone the questions and the offerings and the invitations to the audience so that they never felt agitation about, what am I supposed to do? That's not the question. What am I supposed to do is not the question. Mm -hmm. It is, shall I do this or this or this or this or this? Mm -hmm. That's the question. And then they feel like they own the space, that they have a sense of ownership. And then ownership is authorship, um, mm -hmm. that they are responsible for the outcome and the outcome is not a sort of accident because they didn't know what they were freaking doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I always say like the breadcrumbs have to be super clear. Now, you know, they just need to, but their breadcrumbs are like, oh, I want to eat that breadcrumb. I don't know why. <laughs> You know, and it's like, oh, there's another record. I want to eat that. You know, you make it irresistible um, for people to move down some paths. Mm -hmm. Great. That's the hardest thing for me. One of the hardest things for me as a playwright when I'm first writing a play is avoiding the ambiguity. <laughs> um, I, I want the audience, you know, to feel as though... Um, or to, you know, have space to think about, you know, why is this choice being made or why why are we going in, in this direction? But um I'm loving everything that Tamla just said, especially in the um in the form that I'm creating in, you know, how you how there there's this phase of um 
going into a virtual experience, a phase called onboarding, in which you prepare the audience for what is about to come and you tell them the goals and the expectations <laughs> in mm -hmm. some way or another. And some of it is just like, sometimes, you know, a content creator might just give them instructions to read. But to me, that's kind of boring. So I went about mine and, you know, in a more um, performance based way. But, you know, the, the idea is that and I, yeah, this goes back to the you know question of agency. The idea the idea is that the audience, you know, is not necessarily being led. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have you have a specific goal, you have a specific narrative, but the idea the idea is that they know what to do in this particular world so they won't you know get lost <laughs> you know so yeah that yeah great thanks um what about for you heather yeah i don't um i don't know what i think about the word ambiguity i think i think i'm always thinking about complexity mm -hmm. and i'm always thinking about space to make decisions as an actor writing in space where the actor is going to pick up the material and see the four different meanings in one thing <laughs> and have to navigate four at the same time and also make a decision about one so i think that complexity is where i'm at as writer and actor and a lot of actors will come to me and go what did you mean by that and i'm like well what, you know yeah. <laughs> Where are you at with it? And they're like, well, it's this and this. I'm like, great. It is. It is that and that. But but I also like love Tamala saying everything she said because that's that's what we love directors for. <laughs> like I, I come in with my actor playwright self and I've got all my stuff. And uh -huh. I, I expect my director to be like, great, okay. And, <laughs> and the director what to do. Twice. <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, I love being told what to do. Let's just do, we'll do what she says. <laughs> That's great. I'm going to go into the next question. This is a question from Veda. Um, I loved hearing y'all talk about your different ideas to this time. I was wondering though, what are you all of your ideas on how we can distinguish theater from film, which is some of what you've started to talk about, or even video games at this time? Is it purely about adding different participatory elements to it? Or are there other things? We've talked a little bit about, uh, Tamla, you've broached on this a bit, but I'm wondering if there's anything else we can mine about what makes it different, these video games versus theater as we're thinking about and film. I'm going to say all of it's theater and mm -hmm. then some of it's film and some of it's video games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's the big umbrella is theater. Yeah. And the bigger <laughs> umbrella is storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's great. What, what about, do you guys have different thoughts or agreeing thoughts? Yeah, I, ju I mean, I just think the, the <laughs> form of theater, oh, theater has been needing to adapt and grow and change. So it's like, thank God we're in this moment where we can. Right. So I don't even know. I don't even know what it is. Like we know what it is to sit in a theater and now we're experimenting with hybrid forms. But I'm like, where this could go is um, is profound and endless. And I think like even deciding it has a track like what well, that's a film or that's a video game track just feels so narrowing to me. I'm like, what <laughs> what is the po what is the possibility of what I can dream and do? who can help me make that happen? And how do I do everything I want at the same time? As in, how could it have a live element, like an onstage element, and then you can go into an immersive web thing and they can speak to each other. What if, what if we did that? What if we, what if we were doing these scenes on stage, but those scenes that could only happen across the world? I don't know. Like, I think it's, I think the whole form, we should be, ex we should be so excited that we're in this moment yeah, where the entire form is up for grabs and that we don't have to define it and that we might pull from video games and we might pull from film. But if we're theater makers, we're making theater. If we call it theater, it is theater. 
Uh, not for sorry. anybody to say it's not theater. I said it's theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of those questions that, you know, um, has been posed even before this moment. Um, and the idea of, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been a purist about anything um, except basketball. But, um, <laughs> So I, you know, it, it is a very exciting time. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we, we are talking about all the things that are, ha that, that are being done in the now and it's so no, new and actually, no, it's not. Um, immerse, you know, the, the idea of immersive audiences and, you know, um, having, you know, the, the different ways in which theater, in which theater exists um, before now have been seen as novelty, mm -hmm. but somehow are right now um, possibly turning into necessity. I wonder how quickly we're going to turn, go right back to where we, you know, to the idea of, you know, this ha a thing has to, you know, appear on a main stage, you know, just go back to what it was like prior to the pandemic. Um, I think there are people who are aching to do that and that's fine, but I just, I just really truly believe that this conversation is, a, is, is not necessarily new. It's a continuation. Um, and so I, yeah, the, the thing about it is, you know, as far as me as the playwright who, who's always trying to break form, <laughs> um, you know, I'm not necessarily you know, married to the idea of I have to put certain things into certain cat categories. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first piece of theater that I experienced was the Vice Theater. So, um, you know, it's for me, it's never been that, you know, well, or I've never, I wasn't introduced into theater with the idea to the, with the idea of this is a well-made play, mm -hmm. you know, and it has to be a well-made play. So, you know, it's, yeah, I just, yeah, just in agreement with Heather and Tamla. It's, this is a conversation that's been going on that's not going to ever end. It's just at the <laughs> forefront now because we can't experience theater in the way we traditionally think we, you know, are the, the, the traditional ways in which we have been. Yeah, I think what's interesting, though, is as you were saying, Candrus, that it, that it feels like there's more openness or maybe more interest or more um access to being able to create in these new ways um so i think that's part of what's exciting and it's, it's inspiring people to think in new ways too um as and with that sort of in mind um i'm wondering this is a question from um m gray what else you've seen or experienced that inspires you in terms of audience agency and involvement so have there been other pieces that have inspired you with that had audience agency. Can you say it again? Sure. Sorry. Um, what else have you experienced, other pieces, that have inspired you in terms of the ideas of audience agency and involvement? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I will say that I don't this I don't think this is a well-known piece, but a piece that's that was um done um that I've never seen performed actually that I've you know, that I've only read is very similar to the American Dreams piece that Tamala has worked on. It's called The Attack of the Moral Fuzzies. It is a game show piece. And um it's it's just it's just a very short 10 minute thing. And but it's you know it's one of those pieces that um made me think of how audience participation um can really um yeah be you know how 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 audience participation and agency can really affect um a piece what about it was inspired you what, what were they just, working with? just the thought of a game show being a play and how mm -hmm. um and how like we we've, we've been saying like that a game show you know automatically calls for audience involvement audience participation it out of for whatever reason, when you watch The Price is Right, 
you you get joy <laughs> and pain from watching someone go through the win and lose, you know, trajectory, win or lose trajectory. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, being present in, you know, in a space and having some effect on the way, you know, the, the, the way that this narrative is going to end, you know, gives you a particular, it can make you feel, it's all about how it makes you feel. It can make you, you know, it makes you feel responsible. It also can make you feel, and that response, that feeling of responsibility, can, you know, leads to other things. So yeah. Can I'll I say for myself, I, I mean, I, I loved American Dreams. I love Layla Buck. I love Tamla Woodard. Um, <laughs> but I'll also say about that, what was so. What was so inspiring was watching it with my husband and every moment we wanted to, we were asked to make a decision. We both chose different things. Mm. <laughs> so then it's like two people watching a show where you only get to click one way, mm. right? Throughout. And every single time I'm like, you know, questions that I think, and he just, <laughs> just always, and um, the negotiation of that, having to negotiate as a married couple was really intense through that show and really inspiring and really kind of changed the narrative for me. And the other thing that I find um, that, that has inspired me um, in my work is, is sitting in Meow Wolf mm -hmm. in, um, in Santa Fe. Um, and just loving that world and watching my kids like run into it. My kids, my kids went in, it's like 20 minutes later, I had to come out for something. So it's an immersive world, right? It's not even theater. It's an immersive world. And my kid comes out with his face like, and he goes, mom, this is the best thing I've ever experienced in my life. And then he was like back and he was just like, <laughs> he was so like, alive and didn't know what to do. But then I was watching my kids be that alive and endlessly sucked in while I was two. Well, I just couldn't, I couldn't stop exploring. So that was the first time. And then years, a couple of years later going back um, and sitting in there while I was working on the migration play and just going, God, I want this for, I want this for migration. I want this for migration and climate. I want every, like, I want a world that feels normal. And then you open a door and it's like, you walked through the refrigerator and now you're in the psychedelic backside of the refrigerator's world that is like endless rooms, but that's how it feels to be in climate. Mm -hmm. On the move with people from, and I just, I just keep imagining that that space, even if even if what I end up building is only immersive on the web or if it's live on stage, I don't know. Like I, I'm so inspired by being in that kind of physical space created by artisans where rooms lead to other rooms and you literally feel like you're inside someone's head, heart, the underbelly of the universe. And you see how the universe is connected to somebody's bedroom is connected to something else across the globe. Connectivity. Yeah. I love Meow Wolf also. And I, we got to go there a year ago, um, me and my, my partner and Papa Ono Majanone to give a storytelling workshop. And I was like, you people know how to tell a story. You don't need us here. And, you know, I have to say, I left the same way going like, this is what the theater should look like. From now on, people should walk in a room anytime they want and encounter story on their way to from one thing to the next. And it's, you know, it's, we taught, we taught, there was a question about ambiguity. And the reason that space works so beautifully is because there's not one ounce of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. That every one of the, every inch of each of those spaces is curated within an inch of its life in terms of the artist's vision that they're dreaming wild shit. <laughs> and I'm in, prox I'm in close proximity to it. I touch it. I get to touch it. I sit in the chair that's like leaning like this or I climb that tree and I'm adding my own story to it. Mm -hmm. And, I, and it, is, it is like a beautiful 
thing that recognizes that we're all storytellers, that we're all, all we need is an inciting event. It's really gorgeous. That's so interesting, that distinction that you just made there in terms of not ambiguity, in terms of letting the audience in, but it's really additive is what I'm hearing you saying, that the experience is like, I'm adding myself to this experience rather yeah. than I'm, yeah. I'm filling a hole in some way. Yeah, I'm, tr I'm translating it for my own particularness. Mm -hmm. or, you know, that's, that's, and that's what we do when we go to a museum where we sit in front of a painting, right? We go, what does this mean to me? <laughs> you know? Why don't, why, why am I still standing here? It means something to me. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately you're creating your own narrative, which is partially your narrative and partially the work that you're responding to in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have time for just one more thing. So before we kind of close off, I do want to just ask you about your upcoming either projects that might be exploring form in different ways or ideas that you have or impulses that you want to follow anything in that realm my company is producing a play by um uh called missing them that reza salazar is the is making his debut as a director of and he's joined by anjali um, choi um, from the city which is a brand new journalistic organization that's just going to kick ass you guys um it's called the city and um this project is called missing them and they have they have put out a call to all of new york city to all five boroughs to anyone who who has a lost someone to COVID-19 and they will write, they will write their obituary, a memorial writing honoring those people. And that's thousands and thousands and thousands. And they've completed a, a, a several thousand already. Um, this project is both putting those things on a stage, but those joyful writings that celebrate the lives that of the people we've lost and asking a community to come in the second half and put their own stories on stage. And I'm so excited about the fact that we are transferring the tools of theater making directly into the hands of the audience and saying to them that they are storytellers too and that their stories matter. So that's May 8th and 9th. Come and see okay, Reza good, Salazar's good. debut. More things. More 8th. Okay, <laughs> and 9th. And how do we access that? How would we, how would we get in? Workingtheater.org. Theater okay. ER. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about for you, Candice? Any, any impulses or thoughts? Thoughts? Um, well, not not impulses yet because I'm so in the middle of process with um with the current thing that, that I'm doing as well as another play I'm trying to I'm workshopping with the playwright center leaving teaching <laughs> <laughs> also you might want to talk about that because that talks about that is exploring form in a different way oh yeah um well I will talk about how um, with leaving teaching, um, People's Life Theater commissioned a part of it, and um, we created an OnlyFans account um, for the main character to live, you know, to kind of exist and live in because she has an OnlyFans account and she's a teacher, and that's how, that's one of her side hustles. Um, and the, um, the DP for that project, he he was so so generous um, with the OnlyFans account, and I had written into the script where there was a live chat on the OnlyFans account. So that was you know an inter a really really interesting and fun thing to watch. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of playing with the idea of. Um, it, it's the sister play to the play of Medusa Thread, which both plays are about sex, sexuality. Well, a Medusa Thread is about sexual assault, and this play is about sexual freedom. Um, but the idea of exploring one's own sexuality and what to do with uh -huh. one's own sexuality. <laughs> um, the main character, she she was inspired by um, someone that I read about here, well, that I read about while teaching in Little Rock, Arkansas, a teacher who was arrested for, um, in the act of um, prostitution. 
But um, Mm -hmm. I created this other character out of this who um, is a virgin and a teacher and is exploring selling her virginity and debt and all of that. But why did I start talking about this? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Projects. That's what we're talking about, upcoming projects and what we're working on and so yeah, yeah that, that's that's the other thing that I'm working on right now. Um, but you know, just as far as things to explore, I would say definitely you know go to the Actors Theater Louisville site. I know that um, right now I think um, the um, t- um, Romeo Juliet Romeo and Juliet 2021 is streaming through Actors Theater Louisville until like sometime next week i know it ends in, in a, on an early date in may and that's um an, an excellent thing to look at um and, and your project uh, i want to uh make sure that we plug your project which is going to be uh the end of may right premiering hopefully at the end of may we're still yeah. very much yeah we're still very much in process but the the final product should be finished by the end of may and therefore will be streaming in June. So oh, June. Just- okay, so we all look out for Actors Theater of Louisville um, mm-hmm. to see Candace's project in June. And it's just, Actors Theater of Louisville has like, they did thing. they built like a really, really great platform. They went there and just, you know, built a lot of great shows. So, yeah. Fantastic. I'm going to call it another um, one of the Pirates and Writers, which is Ephes Goodwin, who also has a piece. Yeah. At an online has, festival. So, yeah. Ephes has out. a lot going on. Um, yeah. <laughs> he, he the, the piece um, that he's creating with Actors Theater of Louisville is um, entitled The Ali Summit. So, that is going to live um, in on, on the desktop. I can't recall exactly what platform they're using for his, but I do think they're going to do, he, they're also going to take a part of his project and put it in the, in the VR world. Mm. But the majority of his pro- project, you know, will be um, um, available via desktop. And my project, again, will be available via desktop. If you have VR chat, that's an app you can download. Um, it's, readily available on PC, then, you know, my project will be free to watch. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, you know, and VR chat is, is free to access. So it's just, it's just like downloading Zoom and, and finding, you know, the, the, the world or the title of my project, going to it and, you know, experience it. And that's what we plan anyway. We should Great. Right. We are going to look out for that for sure. Um, Heather, what about for you? I know you, you've got your piece that you're going to do showing of a part of it in June at the Playwright Center. Um, wondering if there's anything else on your mind or any other impulses that you have that you're chasing at this moment. So it's, it's, I've been thinking, I mean, when I think about form with the migration play, I am, I, as you know, Haley, I've been thinking about kind of n- narrowing the big vision in order to articulate something for a sharing, right? But I'm also thinking about it, I'm also thinking about it beyond beyond its big vision that I have in a sort of cyclical nature of saying, okay, I mean, my, migration is with us forevermore. Mm-hmm. Forever, I mean, we're, like I said, we're all gonna be on the move. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's kind of like, how do you write a play where you don't really wanna end it? Mm-hmm. So how do I make sure the cyclical nature is in there so that it's less that I'm rewriting it, mm-hmm. but more that it can adapt as we're all adapting? Because mm-hmm. in, it's kind of like a Susan Laurie Parks 365, like it, it's, it's built of parts, but my form that I'm imagining, because it's built in, this, in a seasonal as in summer, fall, winter, something, something like that we get a such a sense of cycle that it's less about, oh, did I rewrite something, but that you just pull one season out and put another one in, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So that it could be ongoing. And another reason for that, that reason why my head's thinking about that is, is A, the adaptation, the adapting to migration itself, but also adapting to where the theater is going. 
-hmm. I mean, I know that pre-pandemic, my big misery with the American theater was if you weren't in the pipeline, it didn't matter how timely your show was. Mm -hmm. Theaters couldn't do anything fast enough. They couldn't I actually know. speak to the times because you weren't in the pipeline. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how do we speak to the times? Mm -hmm. how, do, how does something live and continue to live in the times, mm -hmm. right? Because, because I think the times will only be changing ever faster and ever faster. So whatever this thing is that I'm trying to build, I'm thinking about that cyclical nature and the other four, the way other way I'm playing with form is I'm thinking a lot about um, pedagogy and how, how I can create seasons where it's teachable. Mm -hmm. Meaning how do I take something that I've built, but then go into pockets, uh, universities, where I'm always asked, come do workshops, come do things, you know, I'm always working at it. But how do you, how does one arrive in a place, like I said, in rural Pennsylvania and in a university in Iraq or Cairo within a month of each other and work with them on a pedagogy of their own personal connections to migration everywhere and then see if I can launch that into how this piece moves, mm -hmm. right? I don't, I don't know yet, but those are the ways I'm considering what's the form of this? Yes, it's a play. Yes, it's like Meow Wolf. Maybe it's an immersive platform, but but how does it grow? How does it how does it become more as it continues to cycle and live? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to take that sort of full circle, I think it goes back to that idea of a aliveness that we were talking about before. You know, what if it was an organic piece that was constantly alive and constantly living and moving and changing? What does that mean in terms of form? So that's fascinating. There's so much food for thought here. Um, you three are extremely inspirational. I'm so excited to um, experience all your pieces and your work moving forward. Um, we're gonna wrap up for this evening. So I wanna also thank the audience. Thank you for tuning in and for joining us and for being part of this conversation. Um, thank you, Tamala, Candris, Heather, and may everyone be inspired to create work moving forward. You guys, thank you, Heather and Kandras. You've like fed me, fed, I like, I'm, I'm so like <laughs> nourished by you. And I feel no, like, wow, yes, I'm, there are remarkable people creating remarkable shit a <laughs> world that I can't wait. I can't wait. I'll be first in line, even if I have to buy the dog on Oculus. Can't <laughs> I can't the wait. It's so true. It's so true. I, I felt uh, as soon as when I knew I was going to have this conversation, I just really felt so lucky to be in the room with the three of you. Um, so thank well, you so much. The word, Pamela. It's the perfect word. Mm -hmm. wow. Nourish. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, we'll have a wonderful evening, all of you and all of you. And um, may we have more work in the future. You're amazing. Yay. Thank you so much. Haley, thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> thank you, Tamara.